Welcome, welcome. It's Levi Brackman here with Truths, Jewish Wisdom for Today. This is our Torah portion on Censored Season, and this week's Torah portion is Sazria. Before I begin, though, I just want to remind you, if you like this podcast, if you enjoy it, please leave a review, like it wherever you listen to this podcast, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere else. Really, really appreciate it. That helps other people find it as well. Now that I've got that out of the way, let me jump into the Torah portion of Sazria. I'm only going to talk about the first two verses of the Torah portion of Sazria. The first verse says, V'idaber Hashem al Moshe Lema, and God spoke to Moses saying, so that's a very simple a verse that appears many other times in the Torah itself. And then the next verse says, Daber al Bnei Yisrael Lema, speak to the children of Israel saying, Isha ki Sazria v'yolda Zohar, a woman who Sazria, and we're going to discuss what the word Sazria means, but some people say it means conceives. A woman who conceives v'yolda Zohar and gives birth to a male, the Toma Shivas Yomim, and she should be impure for seven days. Kimei nidas dvoisa titma. So, which means, and like the days of her separation of illness. And Rashi straight with that voice means something which pours out of her body. Or some people say it means a word of madve v'choyli, which means a type of a sickness. And truth is, Rashi says that they are connected because a woman will only see blood when she has a certain weakness. Some people translate it dvoisa as infirmity. So it means like the days of her separation of infirmity, titma, should she be impure. And during this period of seven days, she has to separate herself from her husband and she can't have marital relations. That is verse two. And then verse three says, just to finish it up, it says, And on the eighth day, you should circumcise the flesh of his foreskin. So those are the first three verses. I'm going to focus on verse 2. Verse 2 says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Isha, a woman, ki sazria, that gives off seed. That's what it literally means. From the word zera, which means seed. Ki sazria, that gives off seed. V'yol zocha, and gives birth to a male. The, the commentators in the Talmud point out that this is a strange formulation of words. Because it could have just said, a woman who gives birth to a son. Why does it say this word, Isha ki sazria, a woman who gives off seed, v'yol dozach and gives birth to a son? Why did it say Isha ki sazria? What does ki sazria mean? So some people argue it's translated regularly as a woman who conceives, but literally it doesn't mean a woman who conceives. It means a woman who gives off seed. The Talmud says in Tractate Nida, page 31, that it means a woman who gives off seed first, then she will give birth to a son. Whereas if a man gives seed first, then the child will be a female. So it adds in this one word, which is, Isha ki sazria zacher. A woman who gives off seed first and gives birth to a male. In other words, the idea here is that during marital relations, during intercourse, both the male and the female are giving off seed. And if the woman gives seed first, then the child's going to be male. If the man gives seed first, then the child will be female. So there's one word added in here by the Talmud, and it's supposed to be read into the subtext, that Isha ki sazria tchila, that word tchila, a woman who gives of seed first, in other words, before the man, so the word first is added in here as subtext, then the child to be born will be a male. The subtext of this is that in the time of the Talmud, they believed that together with climaxing, seed is given off. Now, in terms of the male, that's very obvious that when a man climaxes, he ejaculates, and the ejaculate is usually sperm. And that is it's part of the procreation process. But at the same time, they also believed that when a woman climaxed, she also gave off some kind of 
seed. So if the woman climaxes first and gives off her seed first, then it's going to be a male. If the man climaxes first and gives off seed first, then it's going to be a female. So before I get into the discussion around this and the different commentators, I, I want to just point out something very interesting here. And that is, in our previous episode, we talked about maybe adding in some words as subtext to understand the text or an anomaly in the text. So we had two poem, two verbs one after the other without a name in between. And therefore, maybe we can add into the subtext a different name there. And I got some feedback about this idea that uh, some people didn't like it. But here in the next uh, portion, we find the Talmud itself doing this, adding an additional word into the subtext and saying basically, no, you're missing a word here. And when you add in that one word, tchila, first, that explains the whole subtext here. Now, the other reason why I want to discuss this is because, A, it really fascinates me, this whole concept of the ancient way in which people used to think how the child became a male versus a female. But also, this concept of Isha Kisazriya Tchila, the idea of a woman who gives off seed first and then the child ends up being a male, very few people discuss this. It's not very inspiring, and therefore it's not very well discussed. There's lots of other ideas in this Torah portion which are discussed. The whole idea of Saras, of leprosy, and the reason why people get Saras, leprosy, because they spoke Lashon Hara, they spoke gossip, etc. And what we can learn from that, all of that is very much discussed because it's inspiring, it helps us become better people, etc. But this here is not really discussed, and therefore on the Torah portion uncensored, I want to discuss those ideas in the Torah portion which are not discussed that much. And there aren't that many podcasts or lots of commentary on this particular verse, and uh, I want to put it out there. Not because it's necessarily inspiring, but I just find it really interesting. So what is going on here? Why do they have to say that there is this idea of that if a woman gives seed first, then they have a child which is male? Interestingly, the Talmud has another verse which it also says indicates this idea that if the woman climaxes first, then the child will be a son. And if the man climaxes first, the child will be a daughter. And that verse is found in Genesis chapter 56, verse 15. And it says, Ela bene Leah. And then it says, Vestina Bito. These are the sons of Leah. And Dina is his daughter. The way the Talmud explains that is that the sons are the sons of Leah, the sons of the mother. In other words, the mother causes the sons to be born. That the mother, by her climaxing first, causes there to be sons. But Dina, which is the daughter, she is his son, the son of Jacob, because since he climaxed first, therefore, you now have a daughter, which is therefore... Dina, who's the daughter of Leah and Jacob, she is attributed more to Jacob than to Leah because through him climaxing first, therefore, a daughter is born. So the question is, why do we need both of these verses? Why do we need one verse from Genesis to tell us that if the woman climaxes first and you have a son, and if the man climaxes first, you have a daughter, we also have it here of Isha Kisazria. A woman who gives off seed, and they add in the word tchila first. So the Marsha, who is this 16th century commentator on the Talmud, his name is Shmuel Eliezer Halevi Idols. He writes something which I found really fascinating. And he says that if we just had the verse about Jacob, Leah, and Dina and their sons, then all we would know is that the gender of the child which is born is dependent on the mother or the father. But we wouldn't know whether it was because the mother climaxed first or the father climaxed first. In other words, we wouldn't know the mechanics of it. We wouldn't know the mechanics of how you can manipulate the gender of the child through whoever climaxes first. We would just know that they're dependent on each other, that we would know that as a male is dependent on the mother and the gender being female is dependent on the father. That we would know. We would know that from that verse. But we wouldn't know technically how they're dependent on each other. We wouldn't know what we, one would need to do in order 
to have male children rather than female children. Then the verse which says, Isha kisazria, a woman who gives off seed, and adding in the word tchila first, that a woman who climaxes first, the yol dozacha, they will have a child who is a male. That tells us an added detail of a technical nature that through the woman being mazria first, by her giving seed or climaxing first, then you have a child which is male. And interesting, the Marsha says that without this verse, we wouldn't know the concept of we wouldn't know that a, a man should rest on a stomach in order that the child should be male. If you think about it, back in the 1500s and even prior to that, having a male child was something which was prized. People wanted a male rather than a female. So they're looking for all kinds of tricks of how can I make sure that the child that I'm going to have is going to be a male. And apparently back then, there was some kind of trick which involved resting on the stomach. What does it mean to rest on the stomach? But does that mean that the male is resting on the female's stomach and while they cohabit and therefore ensuring that the woman climaxes first? That seems like that's what it means. But that technical methodology of that, well, when one is having intercourse, to do it in a way in which one ensures that the child to be born will be male, that trick, if you like, we wouldn't have known unless we had this verse in our Torah portion of Sazria that Isha ki Sazria violda zacha, a woman who gives off seed and has a child who is a male, and it means a woman who gives off seed first, and now we know that one needs to do something in order to make sure that the woman gives off seed first, and then you can have a child who is a, who is the gender of a male. So that I thought was really interesting that actually there's a practical thing which he says we now know this trick of how to have male children rather than female children. And we wouldn't know that without this verse. Just a little bit of interesting trivia taking us back to this very enchanted world of the 15, 1600s. What, what is actually happening here? The giving of some kind of seed, it doesn't use the word climax, it uses the word that seeds, that a woman who gives off seed. And there's a lot of discussion about what it means, a woman who gives off seed. What does it mean? To understand what is the seed that a woman ejaculates, if you like, what is this seed that she gives off? And what did the rabbis think it was? So for that, let's look at a Mishnah in Nida, in Tractate Nida, found on Daf Yud Gimel Amad Aleph, Page 13 It says, Which means that when a woman becomes a nidah, this whole idea in Judaism where when a woman menstruates, she then becomes a nidah, which means that now she has to separate herself from her husband and she goes into the state of impurity until she stops menstruating and then she goes through a process where she makes sure she's clean and she goes to the mikveh this ritual bathhouse, and then she comes back out and she's no longer in the state of being a nidah. So it says that if she checks herself very often, then that is praiseworthy. So a woman should check herself very often. The more she checks herself to see whether she's actually becoming a nidah and therefore she should separate from her husband, that's more praiseworthy. And then it says, and what about with a man? Should a man be checking himself very often? And it says... A man should not do that at all. A man should not be checking himself very often. And the Gemara asks the question, what's the difference between the man and the woman? Why is it the woman should be constantly checking herself and the man shouldn't be checking himself the whole time? And the Gemara answers that it's because when a woman checks herself, she doesn't get aroused when she checks herself. And therefore, she's not going to end up arousing herself and therefore coming to climax on her own, and therefore she won't end up wasting any seed. Whereas the man, if he checks himself to see whether he's omitting anything, and there's a whole idea that when a man omits, he also becomes impure. Although when he's impure, he doesn't have to separate himself from his wife. However, there are other things he needs to take into consideration between the different types of holy foods which he can't eat and different other things he shouldn't do when he has some kind of omission which makes him impure. 
So a man shouldn't be checking himself for that the whole time because when he checks himself in that area, he could become aroused. And if he can become aroused, he might end up emitting seed. And if he emits seed, then that is something called um, which means that he's emitted seed, so it's destroyed seed and in a way in which is not in an appropriation type way, not together with intercourse that could end up having a child. And therefore, that's something which is not permitted, and we don't want him to end up doing that. And therefore, it's better that he doesn't check himself the whole time so that he doesn't end up arousing himself. That's what the Talmud says. So it seems from this, at least according to the Tetzvah Sarash, that man and a woman have seed. And the only reason why a man shouldn't check himself is because he might end up being aroused, and that might end up destroying his seed. He might end up ejaculating in a way which isn't appropriate. Whereas a woman, she won't end up ejaculating in a way which isn't appropriate if she checked herself. Therefore, she can check herself. But it would seem, according to the Toysus Harash, that if she would also end up becoming aroused, then she would end up ejaculating and therefore giving off seed. And in that case, uh, she shouldn't check herself very often. It's the only reason why she may check us off very often and it's praiseworthy to check us off very often is because it won't end up in the same place where it would end up with a man. But it seems from this, the Toysa Rosh, that his opinion is, and the way he understands the Talmud, that both the man and the woman have seed. They both ejaculate some kind of sperm type material, both man and woman. So that seems the way, at least for according to the Toysa Rosh, that the rabbis did think that man and woman both had ejaculated some kind of seed, some kind of sperm. Now, again, you're going to think to yourself, one second, what is this all about? Women don't have uh, sperm, etc. So we're not talking about the way we think about it modern times. We're thinking about the way it was thought about back then, many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Toysavus seems to have a slightly different opinion on this, where Toysavus is of the opinion that the reason why a woman can check herself very regularly to see whether she has any omission is because she'll never end up in a situation where there will be an emission of seed. And the, the way he explains it is that women, when they emit seed, they emit seed inside of themselves. Whereas a man, he emits seed outside of himself. So the idea here is that when a man, if he ends up emitting seed, not in the context of procreation, then in that situation, it's completely wasted. It's wasted seed. Whereas a woman, she emits anyway inside, therefore it's more or less anyway inside her, and therefore it's not such a big problem. So in this situation as well, it, one can read the Toysavus to understand that also for the woman, in this situation, there's an emission of seed. Some people will read Toysavus slightly differently and they'll say, well, it's because the woman's seed is not really emitting at all. It's only part of some kind of internal process, and therefore we're not worried about any wasting of seed on her part, only wasting seed of the man's part. However, one can even read Toysavus to read that the reason why we're not worried about the wasting of seed is because it omits inside, and therefore, even if she did get aroused, it wouldn't matter because the seed gets emitted inside. So it's not necessarily a problem of whether it gets aroused or not, but rather because the, the seed which gets emitted is a uh, seed which gets emitted inside. The rabbis did really believe, it seems, in the Talmud, that a woman emits some kind of seed or other. So what is this seed that is emitted, whether it's inside, whether it's outside? If you look at the Sifrona, which is a commentary on the Torah itself, Avadia Benyako Sifrono, an Italian commentator who lived in the 1400s, he talks about this and has a very clear idea of what this is. He considers the emitting of seed of the woman what he calls the wetness that omits from a woman while she's cohabiting with a man. He considers that to be the seed that is omitted. And what's really interesting is that he has this whole concept of how it works that he says that if the woman omits seed first, then you have a situation where the man's seed comes in afterwards and the woman's seed which comes in before doesn't interfere at all with the man's seed. And therefore, the man's seed, when it goes into the woman, it then is able to do what it needs to do without any kind of damage happening to it. And therefore, the child is going to be a male. And this is 
one might say, a very male-centered approach to this. If, however, he says, the man ejaculates first, then you have a situation where male sperm is already there, and now the woman's seed comes in and can cause some kind of damage to the man's seed, and that damage which is caused causes that the child should be a female. In other words, the damage which is done to the sperm of the man by the woman's ejaculate, which comes out second, that damage is what causes the child to be a female. That is what the Sifrono says. So that's his perspective on it. And that's why his science is that, therefore, if a woman ejaculates first, that ejaculate is not going to cause damage to the male sperm. Whereas if the man ejaculates first and then the woman ejaculates, then that ejaculate of the woman is going to end up causing damage to the male sperm. And therefore, that damage is what takes the child down a notch, if you like. And therefore, she ends up being a female. Now, you can think about this from human anatomy. One might think that, you know, a little bit of damage to the sperm can cause that maybe now she no longer has male genitalia and that's what a woman is. Whatever. That is perhaps what he's thinking. But anyway, a fascinating insight into the mind of a rabbi from the 14th century in Italy. The Ramban, the 11th, 12th century commentator, philosopher, and Kabbalist, Rav Moshe ben Nachman, he has a slightly different take on this. And that is that he thinks that, similar a little bit to the Sifrono, that although the woman has some kind of seed, it's not real seed. It doesn't really have any contribution to the creation of the child at all. The fact that it's called seed is kind of a borrowed term. It's not really seed. His view is that this is the blood which he thinks gathers at the end of intercourse. Some kind of blood that gets gathered at the end of intercourse and that blood is what accepts the sperm and that is what ends up creating the child. What he doesn't really explain, therefore, is what it means that a woman is Mazriya Tchila. He doesn't really explain what it means that a woman who's Mazriya Tchila, she gives off seed first. He explains what the seed is, that it's this blood which gathers at the end of cohabitation, but he doesn't explain what really it means that if that happens first. Unlike the Sifrono, who actually tries to explain part of how it works in a technical manner, he just says what this Zera is, and he says that this seed which is really not seed, it's blood, and it really doesn't necessarily contribute to the actual birth of the child. Rather, it just is there to help the male sperm along, if you like. But he doesn't really explain what it means that kisas you would You would think that it means that, yes, similarly that she climaxes first. So he explains a little bit of the anatomy or the, of it and also explains some of the ancient biology of it but doesn't necessarily add any color to what it means that if a woman is Mazria Tchila, a woman who gives off seed first or ejaculates first or, or climaxes first. He doesn't really explain how that works and that causes in a technical manner for the child to be a male rather than a female. He also doesn't explain what we know today, which is how it really works with the egg and the fallopian tubes and how the egg comes out to the ovaries and into the fallopian tubes where it can then become fertilized by the sperm, etc. He doesn't explain any of that either. It seems like back then this wasn't something that they knew or understood at all, and which is n not surprising at all because a lot of the female anatomy wasn't well understood even until very recently. It's interesting that in Hilchas Bia, Maimonides, the Rambam, does have a better, although it is different, than what we have today, but he has more of a better explanation of what the female anatomy is and how all that works. And one of the commentators, the Mishnah Lamelach there, says that because Maimonides knew Chachmas HaNituach, he knew surgery, therefore he was able to know a little bit better and explain some of these Talmudic passages in a way which is more in line with the reality of how the female anatomy was. But even Maimonides, in his Mishnah Torah, in his uh, book of Jewish laws, doesn't explain exactly what this is and how it works in the way we understand it today. To summarize this, we have this one verse in the beginning of the Torah portion which says, 
that Isha Kisazria Violda Zachar, a woman who gives off seed and therefore gives birth to a son, should then sit seven days as a nida, as a separated a woman, and she should be impure. And only on the eighth day, then she should circumcise the child. And the explanation which is given is that what does it mean and a woman who gives off seed adds in one word first, a woman who gives off seed first, that word first is added in as a subtext, then the child will be a son. So as long as she climaxes first, she ejaculates first, then the child will be a son. And there's a lot of literature around this. What does this actually mean? What actually is going on here? And what is this seed? And it seems like the rabbinic consensus is that the woman also gives off some kind of seed. It just, they don't know exactly what that seed is. So to bring this all together to what we know today. So what do we know today? Well, we know today that in order for a child to be born, you need the egg and you need the sperm. And the sperm fertilizes the egg and then the cell split multiple times, etc. And after nine months, the child is born. We also know that every cell has 46 chromosomes. So there's 23 pairs of chromosomes. So that's 46 chromosomes. And the sperm, though, only has 23 chromosomes. And the egg, the female egg, also only has 23 chromosomes. And we know that the female chromosome, or XX chromosomes, whereas the male chromosome has an X and a Y chromosome. And what determines whether the child is going to be a male or female is whether the sperm that fertilizes the egg has a Y chromosome or doesn't have a Y chromosome. If it has a Y chromosome, then the child's going to be a male. If it doesn't have a Y chromosome, then the child's going to be a female. You just have XX chromosomes. That's what we know today. It's a very basic bi biology, which everyone learns in high school. Or if you, anyone who goes to a high school and which studies biology will learn in high school. I learned that post high school because we didn't do biology in high school. But this idea is now obviously something which we know as a fact. This is something which people actually can manipulate. And we know by a fact that if the sperm has an X and a Y chromosome, the child's going to be male. We just know that. So it's certainly nothing to do with whoever climaxes first. We also know that a woman doesn't ejaculate any kind of seed. And we know that the ejaculate of the seed, if you like, well, the emergence of the egg from the ovaries into the Philippian tube has got nothing to do with a woman ejaculating first or not. We know that that has to do with her cycle, which has got to do with glands in the brain. It, it doesn't really have to do with anything related to the actual act of intercourse itself. So if you contrast that with what the Talmud thought it was, which I would add in one other thing which the Talmud says, which is also brought down by the Ramban, by Nachmanides. And that is, he says that the, the different parts of the human body are made up from different parts of the male and female. So, and he quotes this in the Talmud, the Flamad Alaf from Dalaf, where it says that the white parts of the human body come from the man, come from the father, and the redder parts of the human body come from the mother. So he thinks that, yes, there is in a uh, uh, man and a woman, they both, the mother and the father, both contribute to the child, whilst there are other people who think that actually the woman doesn't contribute anything to the child. It's all from the sperm. The Ramban does seem to acknowledge that the woman does contribute something, although he does bring the philosophers who think that they contribute something, but the, the, the most important part is from the male or from the father rather than from the mother. But certainly doesn't think it's 50-50. But he thinks that the white parts, the brain, the whites of the eyes, and other parts come from the man, whereas the red parts come from the woman. And that's how he puts it together. That's in that ancient biology. Whereas today we know that it's basically 50-50, and the key thing which comes from the man, which doesn't come from the woman, is whether the child's gender is going to be male or female. So really interesting, I find, insight into the ancient biology of the time and how they thought about things and how that actually lent itself into practice. We find that the Marsha, he says, we wouldn't know in practice how to do this trick in order to have a child which is a son. And from this verse, we now know that 
and, and so not only was it ancient biology but also that people actually practiced in a certain way in order to be able to have a child which is a son rather than a daughter now what does this all mean today because i remember as a yeshiva student studying this and i had studied a little bit of biology and i came to the teachers and i said what is going on none of this is real and we know it's not real so how are we supposed to take this so this was just ancient biology this is how they saw it. The Torah itself doesn't say Isha Kisazria Tchilo. The Torah says Isha Kisazria, a woman who gives off seed. You can read that as a woman who conceives and you first conceive and then you have a child. Just read it as conceived and now you've got no problem. It's the Talmud which adds in this word Tchilo first, which is really interesting. So this whole way of thinking about how a male child is is formed rather than a female child is formed is really something which comes from from the rabbis it doesn't come from the text of the bible itself that said how are we to understand how the rabbis understood this well the answer is there are many things in the talmud which are found this whole bunch of ancient types of medicine which is found all over the talmud which is really not something anyone takes today at all a lot of the ancient biology a lot of the ancient medicine which is found in the talmud I mean, no one's using anymore, although it came from the rabbis. No one's looking at it and saying, this is the Torah. This is the fact, because we know that these things no longer work anymore. That was the avant-garde of the time. That was the cutting edge of technology at the time. But we know that isn't what we use today. Even the greatest of rabbis are not going back into the old Talmudic potions in order to be able to cure uh, different diseases. So... That's an approach to it and saying, well, this is just ancient biology. And I wish when I was a yeshiva student, they would have said to me, don't worry, it's just ancient biology. They didn't say that to me at all. They were like, no, we need to take this seriously. And they said that in some way, this must be the way it works. I never was able to accept that. But really, you know, this is just the ancient biology of the Talmud. And they read the ancient biology into the text, which then gives us this same type of if the rabbis were able to read the ancient biology into the text we can also give some subtext based on what we know today to the text that is in very good tradition to do that and say yes there may have been a word missing was it edited out was it not edited out that you'll ask the bible scholars but certainly the idea of saying that there was a word missing here or there was subtext of another word which needs to be added in to be able to understand the flow of the text that's perfectly fine to do. And doing that based on an understanding of current day biology or physics or mathematics or current day archaeology, these are all things which are good tools to use in order to be able to understand the text a little bit better. And therefore, part of what we're doing here is looking at that tradition and trying to understand where it came from. I think that this is a fascinating insight into a way in which the rabbis themselves interpreted text, the way they added in words in order to be able to understand the meaning of the text from the Torah itself, and then also how they took ancient biology and try and read that into the text itself, and then sometimes created actual practice out of it. There's one other thing that I would add here, which is really interesting. There's Midrash Tanchuma and Parshat Pekude, which says something entirely different about how male and female babies are formed. It says that basically God decrees it. So the parents have sex and God decrees whether then it's a boy or a girl. And what's really interesting is that this is part of the Talmud as well, which the Talmud says that there are three partners in a child, a mother and father and God. And this is part of that, that you have the mother and father, they do their thing. And then God comes in and chooses whether it's a boy or a girl. So the Zohar says that what happens here is that God doesn't actually actively choose and cause the child to be a, a boy or a girl. What he says, and this is really interesting, the Zohar uses this word where it says that God is able to see which drop goes in and therefore which one's going to be male or which one's going to be female. And it says this on the commentary of the word Isha Kisazria Trilo. It's commenting on that Talmudic interpretation, which says a woman who is Mazria, who gives seed Trilo first, and then it should be a male. 
And he says it's because God can see which drop is going male or female. And I found it very curious that the Zohar uses this word drop because we're not talking about the drop here, are we? We're talking about that's not what it seems like it's talking about. It was always talking about whether it's blood or whether it's the male sperm or this and that. Whether the woman's ejaculate came out first, whether the man's ejaculate came out first. You know, that was the conversation. Here it just says God could see which drop it is, which really kind of indicates this idea of which sperm caused the fertilization of the egg. Was it a male XY chromosome sperm or was it a female XX chromosome sperm? So it's interesting that the Zohar seems to kind of give a nod to what we know today. It's not foolproof because the Zohar is still talking about this idea of a man and female ejaculating first. But it was, I thought, very interesting that the Zohar had this idea of God seeing which drop and recognizing that it wouldn't be God himself which would be causing the child to be male or female, but rather it is God knowing which drop went in first and it doesn't indicate necessarily where those drops came from. But because it's an interpretation on that part of the Talmud which talks about a woman who gives off seed first, that it's either the seed of the man or seed of the woman, which causes the male or female. But it's not clear. So that's another very interesting kind of a little addition that I thought I would add in here. This has been a longer episode. This is really fascinating to me. I hope you've also found it interesting if you've gotten all the way to the end here. Thank you so much for joining me and accompanying me along this whole uh, journey of this idea of the first two verses in the Torah portion of Tazria. Meanwhile, this has been Levi Brackman with Truth, Jewish Wisdom for Today in Torah Portion Uncensored. Thank you so much for joining and until next time.